Yeah, we are getting a lot of illumination from the light of the Supreme through Savitri's lesson to death. She has given him a good lesson in the life divine that that is what is actually planned here in manifestation. You have a certain role there to play, but that is not the end of whole thing. Everything is moving towards divine manifestation in this creation and it has to come. So she is tracing the entire course of not only involution, but also evolution going back to the supramental manifestation upon earth. She is now in the middle of that lesson and she is talking of our knowledge walks leaning on error stuff. That is what we are in the intermediate state, the condition in which we are, we are in the field of ignorance. We are moving from more ignorance to less ignorance. But eventually it has to be from knowledge to knowledge. At this stage, our knowledge walks leaning on error stuff. So the support for knowledge here is error. We fumble, we fall, we make wrong arguments, we struggle. In fact, we are saying that for everything, for life to progress, death is necessary. For bliss to be established in the present condition, sorrow and suffering, they are necessary and like that. So in the same manner, at the moment, knowledge walks meaning on error stuff, a worshiper of false dogmas, and false gods. Well, in a certain sense, this is the entire summary of man's struggling philosophies, his reason, his arguments, all that thing is nothing but the worshiper of false gods. False because they are mental, because they are born of ignorance. Ignorance which itself is a product of falsehood. And therefore, we are all really worshippers of false gods. So all these big isms which I come, Marxism, capitalism, socialism, wealth of nations, whatever, whatever you want to call, they are actually the worships of a false god. They have a certain role to play in a scheme of things, but that cannot be the end of things. A worshipper of false god, dogmas and false god. Now, of course, dogmas is normally associated with religion. We have got religious dogmas. And the Dogmatized religion is a greater obstacle than no religion. The no religion, that is the whole problem actually. So in fact, that is how the teaching of Christ was falsified by dogmatizing his teachings in the Nicene dogma, you see, in the third century AD, you see, that is what they are formalized. And you saw the consequences of that dogma, inquisitions, killing, plundering, all those things, even crusades. They were the worshippers of dogmas in that sense. But normally, we don't really connect this dogma with the other type of dogmas which we really have in us, even reason. Even our stupidities of a particular ism is a dogma. Marxism is a dogma. Capitalism is a dogma. Free speech is a dogma. Because all these are mental formulations. 
they don't have really anything coming out from the depths of the soul, of the spirit. And as long as they lack that depth, they remain dogmas. And you see the consequences we are seeing every now and then, what is happening. The tragedy in Paris is terrible, you see. Last week's tragedy. Or fanatic, or a fierce intolerant creed. So there is such a great debate going on in India about intolerance, you see. He has already anticipated that intolerant creed, you see. Actually, this is a debate not only of intolerance, it has been politicized. It is made a weapon. So everything, every principle which has a certain element of truth in it has become a weapon of attack. It has happened very, very soon. A fanatic or a fierce intolerant creed or a seeker doubting every truth he finds. A seeker doubting every truth he finds. He has summarized, Savitri has summarized the whole of Descartes' philosophy in one sentence. <laughs> I doubt. I am because I doubt myself, you see. <laughs> she has summarized the whole philosophy of Descartes in this one. Seeker doubting every truth he finds, a skeptic facing light with adamant no. Skeptic, that is, that is the foundation of Descartes' philosophy, skepticism. A skeptic facing light with adamant no. A chill, or chilling the heart with a dry, ironic smile. A cynic stamping out the God in man, stamping out God in man. Yes, this is what happened. All our good intentions, good philosophies, idealisms, whatever you want to call them, they are basically removing God from this creation, stamping out God from man, you see. A darkness fellows in the paths of time or lifts his giant head to blot the stars. It makes a cloud of the interpreting mind. Yes, everything has become clouded because of mind. See, we always say you are in a dilemma. You are not able to resolve anything. So you say, I am in two minds. What do you mean by two minds? In other words, every reason has a value. Every reason is true. But these two reasons, the many reasons, they don't reconcile with each other. They struggle against each other, quarrel against each other. So when I say I am in two minds, mind cannot resolve whether I should go this way or I should go that way. It is impossible for mind to decide. Then what is that decides? It is life force, the vital force. And it is that which you then follow and pursue it, you see. A darkness fellows in the past of time or lifts a giant head to blot the star. See, I mean, the whole philosophy, mental formulation has such a measure that it can blot out even the stars. Such is the power. We build up scientific philosophies also. But then ultimately, what are these? We don't know it all, frankly. It makes a cloud of the interpreting mind and intercepts the oracles of the sun, intercepts the oracles of the sun. You get divine revelations. Oracles, they speak of what the divine truth is. Prophets come, great personalities come, rishis come, siddhas come. They speak of God. They bring the divine knowledge, but then they are interpreted by mental formulations. So all our scriptures which are there, ultimately they fall in the hands of man who argues on the basis of his mental faculties. Everything is a Scriptures have revelation. They are oracles of the sun. There is a divine truth in each. But then when they go into the hands of man or the reasoning creature, then all these quarrels and conflicts start. And there is no end to that and intercept the oracles of the sun. In fact, this oracle 
in Greek. <laughs> Mythology, he will tell you more about that, you see. <laughs> yeah, Delphi's oracles. And they make such statements that it can be interpreted this way or that way. Oracles of the sun. But behind that, why, why they can make statements like that? And we say it can be the Greek, the Persians will defeat. That's the oracle. The Greeks, the Persians will. Now, who is going to defeat whom? Will the Greeks defeat the Persians or the Persians are going to defeat Greeks? The oracle says, I mean, that is what happened in the case of the war there, you see. Because we are not able, our language, our formulations, they are bound by mental laws, mental understanding of things. The Greeks, the Persians will defeat. I mean, the Greeks, the Persians will defeat. Or the Greeks will be defeated by the Persians. Both, both the meanings are present in the oracle there, you see. Now, you keep on arguing, arguing and arguing that interpretation. The oracles, you intercept, you don't really understand the contents of that thing at all, you see, in the whole process, you see. And he says, the sun, S is capital, that is the divine knowledge itself. The deity is speaking, is giving you the divine knowledge, but we are formulating the whole thing in our terms and intercepting the revelation which comes. So that is how the scriptures have suffered. All. And intercept the oracles of the sun. Yet, so although this is the condition of the mental being, all that Savitri is telling here, is what the mind of man is capable of. <laughs> that is what he is, you see. But then she says, mind of man is not the last thing. Is not the last thing. Yet, light is there. Behind all the things, there is illumination. It stands at nature's doors. It holds a torch to lead the traveler in. So the light is telling you, walk in into the realms of light. Light is there. But then, of course, we keep on arguing, will I really go properly into the thing? Keep on arguing and arguing, you see. It waits to be kindled in our secret selves. It is a star lighting an ignorant sea. A lamp upon our to piercing the night. It waits to be kindled in our sacred selves. Sacred selves. The depths of darkness which are there in us, it is there that light has to be kindled. It is waiting for that to happen. The realms of darkness which are there. Now, of course, in a slightly different manner, we can even say that cells refer to the physical body. It is there that the light is waiting to be kindled, to be awakened. She is talking that this body is ignorant, is filled up with darkness, but there is a light which is waiting there that it remains the physical also. That may be a little far-fetched sense in the present context, but it can be interpreted in that manner also. Here in the flow of the narrative, it, of course, light, ways to be kindled in our sacred cells. Now, Savitri is actually equating this light to fire, to agni, to flame, because she is talking of kindle. Light is lighted. Light is not kindled. Light, it kindled. So she is really speaking of the flame, the fire, 
which has to get kindled, Agni. It is the divine Agni who has to burn here. It waits to be kindled in our secret cell. Therefore, in the physical also that Agni has to be kindled, has to be awakened. It is a star lighting and ignorant to see. Well, that is straightforward. It is a kind of a narrative. A lamp upon our poop piercing the night. So that light is a lamp, which is fine. Poop, that is the station in the ship on the stern side behind it. You see. It is there, it is lighted, it is burning there to show the night, piercing the night, penetrating into the depths of the night. Lighting and ignorance, a lamp upon our poop, piercing the night. What a beautiful line also, poetry you see. A lamp upon our poop, piercing the night. A lamp upon our poop, piercing the night. You see, and it goes on the music, you see. <laughs> Savitri speaking, poetry, you see. <laughs> As knowledge grows, light flames up from within. Now you can see light flames up. It goes with kindled. She is a real good poetess. Savitri is a real good poetess, you see. It waits to be kindled in our secret cell. As knowledge grows, light flames from within. It is a shining warrior in the mind, an eagle dream in the divining heart, an armor of the fight, a bow of God. So there is a battle we fought. And it is ready to fight the battle. Battle of uh, to be fought with whom? With the knight. It is ready to fight that. As knowledge grows, light flames from within. Now this is important. It has to happen from within. It is not that something is coming from above. It has to happen from within. Bring up, spring up and express itself, conquer the night. The conquer the night is not that by shining the torch from above, the night is removed. The night has to go away from then. As knowledge grows, light flames from within. It is a shining warrior in the mind, an eagle of dreams in the divining heart. Now, mind, heart, everywhere that light is working. Light is working as a warrior. Light is working as an eagle. Light is fighting with an armor, with a bow of God. Bow of God. The divine bow. In Blake, there is a short poem. Bring me my bow of burning wood. Bring me my arrow of desire. He says, bring me my bow of burning gold, you see, that is what he says. I will fight against all the evils with the bow of God. Bring me my chariot of fire, he says, you see. bring me my chariot of fire. I am ready to go as a warrior, to fight as an angel against the demons. So, see, there are, there are certain, subtle references of that kind to various aspects of poetry in various places. Bring me my bow of burning gold is very clear, you see. Bring me my arrow of desire. I shall not cease from mental fight. Bring me my chariot of fire, you see. It keeps on saying like that, you see. Then, so, first he explains that we are moving in ignorance. Then she says, there is a light. Then she is taking her argument forward, light grows, and then comes what? Then larger dawns arrive. See how systematically she is bending up the whole argument. It's a beautiful essay. Then larger dawns arrive, 
and visions palms cross through the being's dim half lighted field philosophy climbs up thoughts cloud bank peel and science tears out nature's awful power and arm a jin to serve it was morning exposes the sigil manushi of her art and conquers her by her own captive force by her own she has given two examples she has given two examples philosophy and science pure philosophy the world of ideas which plato has built science which is not only the physical science the biological science but also the occult science science is more comprehensive here also what does it do it tears out nature's occult powers it is really done from the atom you see a sudden big fire coming out it is an occult thing the bursting of the atom and you see a big fire that is really how science has torn the occult power of nature you see the raven invisible atoms omnipotent to pose that is the line from the raven smashed broken fission raven invisible atoms omnipotent force so that is the gigantism of the occult force that is what science has done science has crossed distances it has gone into outer space philosophies we have seen through the ages how they have marched and am a jin so served at vast small need now this is of course a reference to the puranic jins so it was small name exposing the sigil manusia of her art so every little small small detail is now brought out opened out see that is what larger dawn has brought these are the results of the coming of the larger dawn and am a jin so served it was small name exposing the sigil and manusia of her art and conquers her by her own captive force now this is a very <laughs> complex kind of a line but very is clear also in the sense that conquers her her stands for nature by her own captive force by her, nature's own captive force has conquered all these things in the world after all you are a product of nature and you have conquered that man has come up to a point here he is existing here and he has conquered these things he has achieved these great results so and conquers her nature you are mastered nature now you can play with nature do variety of thing bring out new flowers new vegetables new fruits and what not and what not you see and conquers her by her own captive force we are captive to her but then we are also capable of doing these miracles you see on highs and raised by minds most daring soul see now she is going beyond now beyond the larger dawns on highs and raised by minds most daring soul upon the dangerous edge of feeling time the soul draws back into his deathless cell man's knowledge becomes god's supernal ray now this is of course really something going beyond beyond the greater dawns she is already entering into the spiritual dawn now here into the soul into the possibilities on highs unreached by minds most daring soul upon a dangerous edge of failing time the time itself will fail there it cannot exist the soul draws back into its deathless self so when it meets the deathless self when atman is realized by the jiva jiva then knowledge becomes god's supernal ray the true knowledge comes here 
So that is the moment of the dawn. See how systematically the whole thing is built up. You there is a mystic realm whence leave the power of fire from the eyes of seer and sage. So that is what the real sage and seer is. Uh, what is say? Fire burning off the eyes. The glow. You can't look into the eyes of the sage, of the rishi, of the yogi. There is a mystic realm whence leave the power whose fire burns the eyes of seer and sage. A lightning flash of visionary sight, it plays upon an inward pulse of mind. Thought silent gazes into brilliant void. So, thought itself ceases to recognize anything. So, for it, it's a void. It cannot understand. It's a bright violin. So, the argument is when the inner faculties open out, when the spiritual blossoming takes place fully, the eyes of the rishi or the seer or the yogi, they are like the eyes of God himself, of the seer, of the, of the Agni himself, is flashing. A lightning flash of visionary sight, it plays upon an inward world of mind, so it goes inside. A voice comes down from mystic unseen peaks. Obviously, means all your sense faculties now have opened out to the divine influences. The eyes have opened out, the voice comes, here the eye. The mystic realm leaves down whose fire one in the eyes of seer and see. Now the voice, this has come out. Now this one, what is going to happen to this one? She is giving an example, you see. A voice comes down from mystic unseen peaks. The eyes are not able to see the peaks, but there is something in us which can hear that there is something from the unseen. You know, you are hearing something, but you don't know where from it is coming. Unseen peaks. You are hearing the cry of a bird who is not visible to you. A voice comes down from mystic unseen peaks. A cry of splendor from a mouth of storm. It is a voice that speaks to nice and profound. It is the thunder and the flaming God. See, this is your poetry, you see. <laughs> you can't explain anything. This. A voice comes down to mystic unseen peace. A cry of splendor from a mouth of storm. It is the voice that speaks to nice and profound. It is the thunder and the flaming God. Goes on in that. Thunder and the flaming call. So that voice is summoning you, calling you, beckoning you. Come, come, come. I'm waiting for you. You see. Nice, profound. You see, he's using profound here as a noun. The depth of night. Which cannot be explored. There are Glories and glories residing in the depths of night. They are hidden there. But they can come out and they speak to you. You can't see them, but you can hear voice. A voice comes down from mystic unseen peace. A cry of splendor from a mouth of storm. It is the voice that speaks to night profound. It is a thunder and a flaming call. Now you see again. You have a voice here, you have a voice here, more or less immediately. By classical laws of poetry, this is a law. A repetition of the same words so close to each other is taken as a fault. Not good poetry, but here it doesn't matter at all. The way you read, it doesn't really sound. A voice come down to a mystic unseen peace. A cry of splendor from a mouth of storm. 
It is a voice that speaks to nice, profound. It is a thunder and the flaming ball. It is a voice. I mean, he is rather emphasizing what is that voice comes down. Which voice comes down? It is a voice that speaks. The elaboration of this voice. What kind of voice it is? Where from it is? What is it doing? It is that which is elaborated by repeating the word voice. It is the voice. It is the thunder. And a flaming call above the plane that climbs from nation to earth. So she is now again going back. She is tracing. That is how it has come up from the nation to earth. A hand is lifted toward the invisible realm beyond the superconscious blinding line and plucks away the screen to the unknown. A spirit within looks into the eternal's eyes. So what a great thing which is happening! So the whole evolution now has advanced to this point that the spirit which is there within is looking into the eyes of the eternal. It has already come to that point, my dear death, <laughs> my dear Yama, whatever who you are, you are see, see this what has happened. It's a great thing which is already a spirit within looks into the eternal's eye. Now. He has said earlier, a fire that burns in the eyes of the seer and sage, fire that burns the eyes of seer and sage. Now, it's very difficult to look into the eyes of a siddha, of a yogi, of a realized soul, so powerful. But here now, because the spirit has come out. The spirit can look even into the eyes of the eternal. You can't look into the eyes of the siddha or the yogi, but when the spirit has come out, it can look even into the eyes of God, into the eyes of the eternal. So she is taken care of eyes and looks. Now she is taking care of. Hearing two factors. It hears the word to which our hearts were deaf. It sees through the blaze in which our thoughts grew blind. It drinks from the naked breast of glorious truth. It learns the secrets of eternity. It the spirit. A spirit within looks into the eternal's eyes. It hears the word. It sees through a drink. It learns. All these things are happening. You see. Is he putting it to spirit in your friends? No. He put it in. He put it to spirit. Yeah, but I'm uh, referring to who? Spirit. <laughs> No, no. From the reference, how do you get it? Yeah. Before the right before it was an spirit. Yeah. An spirit, and after he said ill. Ill. Yeah, of course, it. obviously it has to be ill. Yeah. No, that is understood. But I mean, is it referring to spirit? Spirit is uh, uh, masculine or feminine? No, masculine. No, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because it is feminine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In English, it's yeah. <laughs> Is it in English? No. No. It's not English. It's 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 yeah. It hears the word to which our hearts are deaf. Word, the divine word, the divine command, the divine voice. Because it refers to the eternal. His word. He sees to the blaze in which our thoughts grow blind. It drinks to the naked breast of glorious truth. Glorious truth.
clothes is feminine. <laughs> well, in in French, of course, it is feminine. Yeah. But here, in English. Uh, uh, sex. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, but here it is, it is feminine. <laughs> in French, it is automatically la vérité. So it, it is there always. So, but here, but in English, you have to understand it is feminine. <laughs> it drinks from the naked breast of glorious truth. That is why you see naked breast. So the the yogi has no. Hesitation in using this, 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 this kind of metaphors, you see. <laughs> it drains from the naked breast of glorious truth. It learns the secrets of eternity. Thus, all was plunged into the riddling night. Thus, all is raised to meet a dazzling sun. Now, she has summarized the whole of a speech of 61 sentences <laughs> into a single one sentence. All that she has been talking, she has summarized in these two lines. All was plunged into the riddling night. Evolution, involution. Thus all is raised to meet a dazzling sun, evolution. She summarized her whole speech in these two sentences, you see. Of course, thus, you have to go back to the whole uh, argument, play the entire argument, you see. If, if you had to start the whole of Savitri's argument, we could begin with these two sentences, two, these two lines, by saying, all was plunged into the riddling night, all is raised to meet a dazzling sun, and then follow the whole speech. You could bring, without this thus, these two lines, right at the beginning, and the whole thing, you see. She is going to then elaborate by saying that thing. But I can't do that by simply deleting thus. I can't bring these two at the beginning of her speech. Because metrically it is short of a syllable. This all was plunged into the red link night. See, there's a five, five, meet, five feet. So you have to say, all was thus planned, all was how do I say? I mean if you want to bring it earlier, you have to you have to supply one more syllable somewhere. <laughs> well, I can say like this all was plunged into the great riddling night. All is raised to meet a great dazzling sun. <laughs> then metrically it is perfect. All is plunged into the great riddling night. All is raised to meet a great dazzling sun. You could bring that thing then forward, you see. So this is now she has kind of summarized her argument and she is now addressing apotheosizing that directly telling him, oh death. This is the mystery of thy reign. She is saying that it is your reign, your governance, your rule, your world. Why it is like that, etc., etc., etc. She has given the whole sequence of operation. All was plunged into the night, all is raised to the sun. This is the mystery of your existence, of your being there. The fulfillment of your presence is for this purpose. Mystery of thy reign. Actually, it is not, she says, it is not God's mystery. It is not God's reign. It is your mystery. This mystery. Yes, but she is speaking about these two lines before. 
Yeah, all this. See, now these two lines summarize the whole of her okay. argument. Okay. These two lines means they have taken care of whatever she has said in those 61 sentences. Now she says, this is the mystery of everything has plunged into the night, everything is coming up towards the rising sun. That is the mystery of your existence, of your creation, of your being there. Why you are there for? What are you there for? You are there for this purpose. You have a role. At the moment, it looks as though you are playing a negative part. But basically, truly speaking, the purpose, the objective of your existence is to raise and meet the dazzling sun. Now, thy reign is very important. She is finally attributing the whole process, the whole creation to death. It is death who is promoting this. Involution has taken place, evolution will take place. It is your reign which is promoting all this thing to happen. Because of your existence, your presence, this thing will happen. In other words, death is really the instrument for the divine manifestation in the present condition. In the Indian tradition, this earth, where all these things are happening, all us plunge into the riddling night, all race to meet a dazzling sun. Where? On the earth. Everything is happening on the earth. Earth has been created as a specific center of activity with this thing in mind, with this intention. Earth is the center. And the ruler of this earth is death. As it stands. Therefore, in the Indian tradition, this world is also called Mrityu Loka, the mortal world. Mrityu, mortal, loka, world. So, Mrityu, death. So, this death, this world is really built for this purpose that everything is plunged into the riddling night. Out of that riddling night will come the dazzling sun. All that is happening in the mortal world on Mrityu Loka. It is not going to happen in heaven. It is not going to happen anywhere else in this creation at all. It is going to happen specifically on earth, which is the center of the manifestation in this creation. And he is the Lord of this earth. Therefore, thy reign. It's a very powerful phrase, thy reign, you see. Yes. But after, when the Supraman will come on earth, it will be no death. So it's no more his reign. Yeah, but no. what what then is what is going to happen? Then you will see the true form of death. At the moment, at this stage, you are seeing this false form of death. <laughs> what you are saying, behind him there is really the Lord himself standing. You will see the true form of death at that point. And therefore this is your reign now. So as long as these two things are there, what you see, this death, is the dark form of the Supreme. But it is ultimately, really speaking, the form of the Supreme Himself. Mm -hmm. 
and therefore in us anomalous and tragic field. So this earth, mrityu, dye, rain, they are again linked up, you see. Oh, death, this is the mystery of dye, rain, in us anomalous and tragic field. Anomalous, yeah, it looks very puzzling to us. So what? It looks very tragic also. There is suffering, there is grief, there is sorrow, there is pain, there is falsehood, there is ignorance, there is death, all the things that there. So it looks very tragic to us. The world looks like a failure of God. It's a failure of God, you see, tragic. And failure is always an orphan. Nobody will respect a person who has failed. He has no parents. He is left on the streets to suffer. And failure is always an orphan. When you are success, then there will be the applauding crowd around you. But when you have failed, nobody cares for you. Is it true? <laughs> well, not, not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. Yeah. Because how is he no hope for this? You know, for uh, this, uh, you see that Jesus, he, he spoke about the, the child who was lost. Uh, That's an orphan. How we call it? Orphan? Orphan. Yeah, because, uh, I'm talking about orphan. What you mean yeah. by orphan? Yeah, yeah. A child who has no parents who is abandoned on the streets and living there. Yeah. Nobody cares about him. Jesus, he said, he left all his yeah. Yeah. children yeah. to go to this one. Yeah. <laughs> so that is what a failure is. Failure is an orphan. There are no parents for the failure. Nobody will take care of him at all. In us, anomalous and tragic field, carried in its aimless journey where the sun made the force marches to the great dumb star. A darkness occupied the fields of God and matter's world was governed by thy shape. And then she clarifies, thy mask has covered the eternal space. You have put on the mask has covered the eternal spirit. The bliss that made the world has fallen asleep. So the eternal in the world of death on Ruthyuloka is an orphan. Bliss in the world of death in Ruthyuloka is an orphan. Nobody takes care of him at all, you see. Abandoned in the vast, she slumbered on. Abandoned in the vast, she slumbered on. The bliss that made the world has fallen asleep. She, who is she? Bliss. 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 Yeah. He's clear there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, in English it is very difficult. In French it becomes clear. La, la felicite. What is the word you are using for bliss? Felicite? La, la felicite. That's right. Therefore, it is. <laughs> yeah. Abandoned the vast, she slumbered on. An evil transmutation overtook her members till she knew herself no more. She has become real an orphan. Only through her creative slumber flit frail memories of the joy and beauty men under the sky's blue love 
with green scarf to trees and happy squandering to saints and youths in the fields the golden promenade of the sun and the vigil of the dream light of the star amid high meditating hits of film on the bosom of voluptuous rain kissed earth and by the sapphire stumbling to the sea in one single breath she sing all those things you see <laughs> and what a powerful poetry it is seen only through her creative slumber she is the ananda that is bliss it is because of ananda that all the activities are going on otherwise nothing can happen there is a secret hidden delight which prompts you to do all these things in everything although it looks perverted it looks bad etc etc still it is that doing the delight of doing is what prompts you to do things you see through her creative slumber so she is asleep but that sleep is a creative sleep frail memory is a joy therefore there are memories only memory is a joy well earlier when she was not slumbering she was awake the memories of that vacant state frail memories of the joy and beauty meant what they meant really when you are awake and what that meant she is going to describe that the sky is like this the peaks are there dreams are there all the things she is describing now one by one means the memories of what under the sky is blue laugh mid green scarf the trees so the trees are very like a scarf you see green scarf trees and happy squandering of saints and youths perfumes of their colors are there they scattered everywhere by whom by the joy which is there earlier memory is a joy and beauty and happy squandering of saints and youths in the field of the golden promenade of the sun so you are really moving on the golden beaches of the sun and enjoying the sunshine and happy squandering the saints and you in the field the golden promenade of the sun and a vision of the dream light of the star so during the day it is here in the night dream light of the stars and they are watching everything all the moment i mean high meditating heads of the hill of hill on the bosom of voluptuous rain kissed earth and by the sapphire tumbling to the sea so the tides are tumbling down like that you see so all these things is what these are the creations of joy and of that joy of that bliss you have the fail memories because you are living in a state of creative slumber but now the primal innocence is lost and death and ignorance govern the mortal world death and ignorance mortal world mrityu loka and nature's visage wears a grayer hue that is what the original bliss has meant created but what is now primal innocence is lost that beauty is lost ah uh, still has kept her early charm and grace the grandeur and the beauty still are her they are not there now but they can be her but where is the divine inhabitant yes the whole thing is so beautiful all that because the divine inhabitant is there he is sitting there because of him is there though He is veiled. It is because of his presence there that everything looks beautiful, everything looks charming, attractive. Her still has kept her early charm and grace. The grandeur and the beauty are still are her, but veiled is the divine inhabitant. So, his under Yami, the one who is 
dwelling within us he is there and because of that you have this beauty and grace and charm the souls of men have wandered from the light and the great mother turns away her face and the great mother turns away her face she feels sorry that the souls have wandered away from light she is helpless although the whole thing is a creation of bliss but the souls have wandered away from light to discover light wandered away for what to discover light there is an attraction in wandering away there is a charm there is something hidden secret bliss is there and in search of that secret bliss which is hidden from the soul it is for that purpose the soul has wandered away from light if i am in the world of light well i have a certain bliss but then i see below a darkness and i wonder can there be beauty there can there be joy there i become curious of it and look into it plunge into it i wander away from light to look for beauty and joy in the darkness where it is not therefore i have wandered away from that and so some men have wandered from the light and the great mother turns away her face the great mother <laughs> this word mother appears 60 times in sabitri Sixty times in different context. There is the mighty mother we have seen earlier. There is the mighty mother. There is the ancient mother. There is the terrible mother. There is the ambiguous mother. There is the heedless mother. So all types of mothers are present here. But here she is talking of the great mother. Turns away her face. now in the present context who is this great mother no no there are different mothers i told you there are 60 types of mother 60 occurrences of mother is savitri <laughs> ancient mother is different than the terrible mother than the heedless mother than the mighty mother than the divine mother you see all they, they are there they have got different things here and a great mother obviously this is bliss <laughs> he says no naked breast of naked breast of truth no wisdom from which you drink naked breast so she has now great mother turns away her face because the soul has wandered away therefore there is no bliss she is not very at all about you so to say in fact he says guru she says she, she clarify the next sentence the eyes of the creatrix the bliss are closed and sorrow's touch has found her in her dreams so she has identified this great mother with this creatrix bliss actually right in the beginning of sabitri 
on the second page itself we have got the heedless mother of the universe heedless mother of the universe one twelve one point one two one point one two you got it as if a childlike finger laid on a cheek reminded of the endless need in things the heedless mother of the universe an infant longing flush the somber past this heedless mother Pardon me? Heedless. Heedless. She is not here. She is not here. Ah. She is not worrying about what is happening. Oh. Here, this is what I have now. That heedless is explained here. She is turning away her face. She is turning away her face, what we have got here. So actually to understand this phrase, heedless mother, into first canto, you have to really go <laughs> all the way down below there. In fact, Savitri explains Savitri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is here is also explained somewhere in Savitri. Savitri explains Savitri. See. The souls of men have wandered from the light and the great mother burns away, turns away her face. You see in this line here, as if a childlike finger laid on her cheek, but she doesn't care. The child is crying, weeping, but she doesn't care. We have to grow, we have to find light. You have to find it is yours. The souls of men have wandered from the light. So she doesn't care. Now that that should happen, it is for that purpose in the first canto, the necessity of the incarnation of the Divine Mother, Divine Savitri, as human Savitri is established. That she should become a heeding mother of the universe. Now she is heedless, that she should become heeding mother of the universe. The necessity of the incarnation of Divine Savitri is established that way, you see. The Great Mother turns away her face then who is going to make her do what she must do? The incarnate Savitri. How is that going to happen? The souls have wandered away from the light, the mother is not bothered about it, then how are things going to happen? For that purpose, there is the necessity of the Divine Savitri taking a mortal birth and coming as human Savitri. It is she then who will work out. She will argue with death. Mr. Death, you are there. You have done a wonderful job. But now that is over. You please go away from here. And then the thing will start happening. Then the divine event will start moving forward. The eye, the creatrix bliss are closed and sorrow's touch has found her in the dream. I don't know, well, I think we understood <laughs> what she said. <laughs> I think we understood. But I don't know whether Yama has understood it or not. <laughs> whether, death, whether death has understood or not, I don't know yet. She has not done, she has explained all the things, she has taken such great trouble and all that thing, but I don't think she has really grasped yet. Because he's still going to argue with her. The eyes of the creatrix breasts are closed and sorrow's touch has found her in a dream. As she turns and tosses on her bed of void, 
because she cannot wake and find herself and cannot build again her perfect shape, oblivious of her nature and her state, of her nature and her state. She is oblivious of nature. What she is, she is not of. Forgetting her instinct of felicity, forgetting to create a world of joy, she weaves and makes her creature's eyes to weep. Dissing with sorrow's edge the children's breast, she spends, her, she spends her life's vain waste of hope and toil, the poignant luxury of grief and tears. So she is heedless. There's a description of the whole thing here. In the nightmare, change of her half-conscious dream, tortured herself and tortured by her touch, she comes to her hands and bodies and her lives, wearing a hard and cruel mask of pain. So she comes as, ma as pain then. She is wearing the mask of pain, hard, cruel mask of pain. In other words, in reality, pain is the secret delight behind things. The secret delight behind things. We call it pain because we are seeing everything under the mask, under the cruel mask. Our nature, twisted by the abortive birth, returns wry answer to life's questioning shocks, and acrid release finds in the world's pang, drink the sharp wine of grief's perversity. That is what we have got. Drink the sharp wine of grief's perversity. We enjoy perversity. We enjoy grief. That is perversity, you see. Worse pangs, questioning shocks, all the things are, this is the abortive birth. Our nature twisted by the abortive birth. And because of that, she is summarizing. A curse is laid on the pure joy of life. A curse is laid on the pure joy of life because of this mask, because of the presence of Monsieur Death. <laughs> A curse is laid on the pure joy of life. Delight! God's sweetest sign and beauty is been. Now, she is making a wonderful statement here again. Well, everywhere she is making wonderful statements. <laughs> what is delight? It is a sign of the presence of God. He is there, therefore there is delight. How do you know that God is there? Because there is delight. You enjoy life, you enjoy wine, you enjoy nature, you enjoy mental thoughts and all that thing. Why? You are enjoying that because of God. It is through that you recognize the presence of God, God's sweetest sign. So when you see a beautiful nature, really behind that is He who is present. That is a sign of His presence there. Delight, God's sweetest sign. And what is delight also? Delight is the twin of beauty. Beauty and twin, sorry, beauty and delight are the twins. Delight and beauty are the twin. Where there is delight, there is beauty. Where there is beauty, there is delight. They are inseparable twin. In other words, the moment delight was born, was also born beauty. They are twin. They, born, they were born together. The birth of delight and beauty 
has taken place together delight god's sweetest sign and beauty's twin so he is the twin of delight they are twins rather yeah, yeah. Beauty is equal to truth. Beauty? Truth is equal to truth. Beauty? And truth. Truth and beauty. Beauty and truth. Beauty by itself, beauty. Yeah, but uh, we asked him that he said beauty and delight. That it means? Beauty and truth. 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 Yeah, truth. Truth. Beauty and truth. 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 No. No, no, truth, she is not talking about, no, she, uh, truth is separate thing. Oh, you are talking about, uh, well, that is uh, kisses. Beauty is truth and truth is beauty. That is kiss, that is another one. He is, she is saying here that delight and beauty come together. They come together. See, you have got truth, beauty, delight, power, and the spirit. Life. Here, she is speaking of delight and beauty because this is in the context of the creatrix bliss. This is in the context of the creatrix bliss. When there is bliss, when there is delight, it means there is beauty. Automatically, inseparably. But there is, there is a little question in my mind. Delight and beauty are the twin, they are born together. Now, in the case of a human twin, They don't come out together at the same moment. They come out. <laughs> they come out with a small time gap in between. It can be as long as ten minutes. The first comes out, then after ten minutes, the second comes out. You see. Now, if they come out at different, with a definite time interval in between. It means that their horoscopes should be different. Yeah. <laughs> Is it true or not? Because horoscope depends exactly on the moment of your birth of coming out into existence. So the two who are coming out, the beauty and the truth, as twins, their horoscope should be different. <laughs> Even for a second. Yes, they are not in the same moment of time. So, I would say that although delight and beauty are twins, their horoscopes have to be different. <laughs> Is it true? Yes, I remember that in one in one letter, Shri says Ananda. Yes. And he says in three ways love, not bliss, love, and beauty. Yeah. So we are here, we have two aspects yeah. of Ananda. Actually, the, the, according to the mother, love is before all that. Love is before. Huh. It, is, it is because of love. There is a delight and beauty. It is because of love there is delight and beauty. Hmm. According to the mother, which is which is perfectly correct. Of course, we can give a certificate to the mother. <laughs> yeah. The universal, the, the 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 love of the Lord. That is the thing from which then all these things come out. Now, my point is, therefore, in the process of manifestation, if delight and beauty, although they are twin, their moments of birth are slightly different, and therefore, their course of operation and working in the manifestation had to be different. 
had to be different. It is not the same thing you see to it. They had to be in a different way. The delight will work in a way, beauty will work in another way, you see. Now, delight God's sweetest sign. It seems that beauty is not really that much of a sweet sign of God. See, delight is the sweetest sign of God. But what about beauty? Is beauty also the sweetest sign of God? <laughs> it doesn't seem to be the way it is constructed. So the primary thing is the ananda. Although ananda accompanies, is accompanied by beauty, but the sign of God is ananda. Delight, bliss. So, truth is beauty, beauty is truth. That is what Keats says in his uh, uh, Ode to his uh, um, Grecian urn, you see. But he has missed that beauty and truth. Beyond that is the creative ananda. There has to be delight. Truth and beauty because of delight. Because of delight. So that way he has missed the delight part of it. You can't therefore equate truth and beauty together unless there is delight behind them all. Delight, God's sweetest sign and beauty is twin. See, he doesn't say delight and beauty, God's sweetest sign. That's good. God, delight and beauty as twin, God's sweetest sign. He doesn't say that. He means Savitri. So Savitri is more concerned about delight than beauty in this context. Here. Because the whole thing is about the creatrix bliss. She is the creator of Ananda. Delight, God's sweetest sign and beauty is twin. Dreaded by the aspiring saint and austere sage. Dreaded by the aspiring saint and the austere sage. That is really the test of your spiritual maturity. Are you able to bear the divine delight? Are you strong enough, prepared enough? Therefore, the aspiring saint and sage they are also kind of afraid of the power of that delight which might enter in you. You are not able to hold the delight. If the saint and the sage can hold the divine delight, it means that the physical transformation has already taken place. The physical transformation as only when the physical transformation has taken place can you really hold the delight. Dreaded by aspiring saint and austere sage, although he has done great tapasya, he is not in a position to hold the divine delight in him. His instrumental faculties have not grown fully well yet. What the Vedic Krishna says, his physical is an unbaked vessel, a vessel which has not been baked, and therefore, if the delight enters into it, the vessel will crack, will break. A tapta tanu, that is what is a tapta, unbaked vessel. Dreaded by aspiring saint and austere is shunned a dangerous and ambiguous cheat, a species trick of an infernal power. It tamed the soul to his self, heart, and fall. 